Today, the markets are disconnected from reality. A US perspective. Hello again, it's Martin North from Digital Finance and others. It's Wells North's Post, covering finance and property news with a distinctively Australian flavour. Today, I'm joined by Steve over in the US. Hi, Steve. Hi, Martin. Thanks for having me on your show. Well, I really appreciate your coming on. And as an investment advisor and as a financial planner based in the US, um, you're right in the middle of what's going on over there. And I thought it'd be really good to get um, something from the front line, as it were, in terms of what on earth is happening? But anyway, start by introducing yourself and a bit about, a bit about your background. I, I'm Steve Van Meter. I'm a certified financial planner and macro money manager here in the United States. I host a show on YouTube where three days a week we talk about macro investing. And I'm also the inventor of a formulaic investment strategy following the macro trends called Portfolio Shield. Great. Okay. And uh, we'll put links to your YouTube channel below because, uh, uh, you know, there's a lot of very interesting discussions going on at the moment. One of the questions I always come back to is, is the stock market disconnected from the real markets and, you know, the real world? What do you think? Uh, there's no question it is completely disconnected from the real, real world. And uh, we're going to find that out here in the second quarter earnings, which are, are coming up very shortly, as you know. And it's going to be really interesting to me to see how much people have overpaid for stocks compared to the fundamental values. And as you know, they've done that simply because they believe that the Fed can put a floor under stock prices. And, well, we know that they can't do that but it hasn't stopped investors from believing in the power of quantitative easing in the Fed. Right. And we know that there have been a lot of new investors going into the market. Um, you know, the number of new accounts has gone through the roof and a lot of them are actually leverage investing as well. So effectively, they're piling in just as the market reaches the top. Yes. And they're using a lot of the stimulus money they received from the government, which is interesting to me because as we went into the pandemic, I believe a lot of people thought it was going to be very short term in nature that they were going to get this money from the government and, and shortly thereafter they would go back to their job and they actually believed things were going to be better than before. And now we're starting to find out that, well, you're going to, you might be going back to work if you have a job. And if you do, your pay is probably going to be less and your hours are going to be less. And so it'll be really interesting to see in the June data. And I believe we will see a big drop in spending as people realize that, hey, I better hold on to that money because it's almost gone. Mm. And we know, of course, that the Fed has thrown a huge amount of liquidity into the markets, and most of that's gone into the financial market. So that's un underpinning it. But in the real world, the unemployment rate is very high. And uh, of course, the virus hasn't gone away. In fact, it's raging significantly in some states, isn't it? Yes. In fact, we're seeing it here in California where I'm at and other states nearby, Texas, Arizona, and some of the southern states, an uptick in cases. And a lot of it's just because people here don't think it's that big of a deal. And, you know, you, in fact, the other day uh, I went by a very popular local restaurant to pick up some takeout, and which I thought was really smart. The restaurant had everyone who was waiting sit outside in 105 degree weather. Uh, <laughs> There were four families sitting outside. Not one of them was wearing a mask. And I thought, wow, that is just a sign of what is to come here. Mm. And so I guess from an investment point of view, then it must be very hard to be making secure calls at the moment. You know, there are some uh, very large investors who are still sitting on the sidelines saying, I still think we're, it's overvalued. It's going to come back. There are others who are beginning to sort of doubt their own uh, intelligence in terms of how they're reading it. Where, where do you sit on that on that uh, spectrum? You know, I think you can make a call in this market, but it's not an easy one because a lot of professional money managers did not you know, buy the dip in March. They sat it out. They, they didn't believe in it. But if you understand quantitative easing and what the Fed is doing, that is very it's very deflationary. The simple call is, is the U.S. Treasury bond market. I mean, we know the more the Fed does in QE, the more deflationary it is. And in deflation, we know stocks go down and bonds go up. It's, it's very simple. But a lot of investors don't really believe in the US bond market, so they don't look at it. <laughs> That's very interesting. And uh, I, I was chatting with Harry Dent the other week, who, of course, is also saying the markets 
you know, may well run higher, but will come back. And ultimately, we're probably going to end up in a deflationary spiral, not an inflationary spiral. And in fact, many people say, no, 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 you know, inflation is going to rule the roost. Um, but uh, my own perspective is I think that's probably a bit simplistic. Well, I think it comes back to is, is quantitative easing inflationary or deflationary? And a lot of people really don't understand it. They believe the Fed is injecting liquidity or putting cash into the economy. And that's really not how it works. Quantitative easing is simply a swap in reserves. So if we look at the large commercial banks reserves, they hold treasury securities with an average maturity of seven years. When the Fed comes in and buys those reserves, the, the public thinks that, okay, here, you're getting some cash and the banks can just do whatever they want. And that cash is just super inflationary. That's actually not the case because the Federal Reserve Act of 1937 is very specific. It says you can't print money. And so how does the Fed get around that with quantitative easing is that cash that the banks are supposed to receive actually goes into a reserve account held at the Federal Reserve member banks. The bank, the commercial banks can't withdraw that money. They can't touch it. Now they can lend against it if they want to risk their capital. And of course, that means the borrowers will have to risk their capital, but it just sits there. So what happens is we get a swap of an average of a seven-year maturity debt, which is paying more interest for an account sitting in cash where the banks do get the interest off of it, but they can't touch it. So it's really not inflationary at all. It's actually deflationary. And we know that because if we look at something called the money multiplier, which is the M2 uh, money supply divided by the monetary base, and your listeners can easily chart this. If they go to the St. Louis Federal Reserve or FRED database, they can look up the M2 and, and with a little bit of math adjustment divided by the monetary base. And what we find out is the Fed does control the monetary base, but they can't control the M2. And they control the monetary base through open market operations, which is essentially what quantitative easing is. So if we look at inflation from the perspective of the money multiplier, when the money, money multiplier is rising, it's a sign of short-term inflation or rising inflation. If it's falling, which happens during quantitative easing, it's deflationary. And so that's how we know that quantitative easing is actually deflationary, even though everybody, every investor and you know, money manager and hedge fund is betting on inflation, they're going to be wrong. <laughs> and presumably that has an impact on where gold is likely to end up. Well, that is a good question. And this is one area that I'll be very clear to your, your listeners, I'll, I'm, I might be wrong, but if you look at inflation sensitive assets, during a period of deflation, you actually would expect gold to go down. Now there's a bunch of people, you know, very bullish on gold. And again, I could be wrong on this, but the way I look at gold and other inflation sensitive assets is through real yield, which or inflation adjusted yields. And if I'm right, and we continue to see treasury yields go down due to the money multiplier falling and quantitative easing, well, a lot of people don't realize that the consumer price index, which is the component in real yields, actually lags treasury yields. So I expect there to be a huge drop in yields, just or a huge drop in uh, consumer price index, just like we saw during the great financial crisis. And even though I, I do agree that gold is likely to head much higher in the future, in the short term, I believe there's going to be a knee-jerk reaction down when real yields rise. Mm. Yeah, well, it's interesting because I one of the, the big conversations I have is, is gold, gold going to go high, going to go low? You know, nobody quite knows. And it doesn't seem to me to be as a certain bet one way or the other because there are so many other variables that are actually um, sloshing around in there. You know, what, what, what are central banks going to do? How much more QE will they, will, will they go? Where will the virus run to? I mean, all of those factors seem to me to be um, unknown unknowns a little bit at the moment. But one of the things I wanted to touch on was the PPP program. So, you know, money for real people and, and real businesses. How do you think that is going? Do you think that's having any real impact? Well, from what I'm hearing, it is having an impact, although a lot of businesses applied for it or started the application process and then backed out. And part of the problem that they ran into is they had to keep paying their employees through the duration of the program. And a lot of businesses were looking at their you know, finances and cash flow and do business for that matter and saying, yeah, I'm probably not going to keep these people around anyways. And what a lot of investors don't realize is the PPP loans didn't pay for everything. 
Now, I believe they've changed that so that it can cover a lot more, but employers were still looking at having to pay for health insurance and other things. And, and they thought, you know what, I'll just go ahead and lay these people off because reality is I'm probably not bringing them back anyways. And so has there been an impact of helping businesses stay open? It, it has, but beyond that, I'm not sure it's going to keep them open after it expires. I still think there'll be businesses that close shop. Mm, well, certainly in Australia here, we're seeing, um, uh, you know, there were some parallel type programs where effectively there was support for businesses and for consumers. But unfortunately, we're now seeing some business still saying it's not enough. And, uh, you know, as that support is taken away, um, that's when the crunch time will be. So we're not at it yet. Yeah, I, I definitely agree with that. I mean, you look at, say, restaurants, for example, and obviously they're big recipients of the PPP loan here. And, and most restaurants can't operate just on 100% capacity. They need to turn tables every night. Well, how do you do that when you can maybe, when things are good, have every other, other, every other table filled? I mean, it's just going to be difficult. I, I don't see how uh, the PPP loans can keep a lot of small businesses afloat, even though they are the lifeblood of our economy. I, and I feel real bad for a lot of small business owners out there. I, I just don't see that once all the stimulus goes away, and I also don't buy that the government can indefinitely continue to borrow money to do this. I, I just think the reality is there's going to be a lot of business failures and it, it's going to be very unfortunate. Yeah. Well, what does that then say about the Fed's policy? And, uh, you know, basically, what is the Fed doing and who is it really supporting is my, my key question. Well, we know the Fed is trying to support the stock market. I mean, there's, there's really no question that they're attempting to do that. But the Fed doesn't have control over the market. And a lot of investors really believe that you know, QE makes asset prices go up. But, but let's talk about why the Fed is so fixated on the market and is because they know that the consumer in the United States, and I'm sure it's true in Australia and other countries, is 70% of the economy. And there's no doubt that when you and I feel rich and think we're going to be richer in the future, we, we borrow money and spend it today. And so the Fed knows that it's just a form of trickle down economics. And so because the Fed doesn't have control over the market, they do have what's called forward guidance or is what many of us call job owning. And they know if they can go out and talk the market up, it works because they know that their policies don't work. And a lot of investors say, well, what do you mean? We saw the market go up for 10 years due to QE. Well, hold fast, because the first phase of QE1 was, was very deflationary and led to a crash in stock prices. And in March, the Fed was doing quantitative easing, and yet the stock market dropped. So there's zero evidence from either the Fed or any other central bank in history that they can support asset prices. But they're desperate to do it because as long as I feel okay, I'll go out and spend it. If I spend, that might go to your income, and then you go spend, and the cycle can persist. In the end, it won't work. Right. And I guess then the question is, at what point will that um, you know, event happen? Will it be after the election? I mean, is that another factor we should uh, put on the table in terms of how things are being shaped at the moment? You know, the election is a factor, although I'm not completely convinced the stock market makes it that far. And the reason I'm not convinced is there's a, approximately somewhere between an 18 to two month to two year lag on monetary policy. And, and I think it's closer to two years. And we have that lag. It's simply a function of the amount of government debt. The, the more debt the economy has, the longer it takes for monetary policy to hit the real economy. Meaning today, we're still feeling, feeling those 50 billion per month, uh, what I call nuclear monetary bombs that the Fed was withdrawing two years ago. And those are leading right up to the election. So I'm not convinced we make it there, especially considering the extra $600 unemployment, what I would call bonus, I don't know what the exact right term is for, that expires at the end of next month. And so now all of a sudden workers who have more money in our home now are going to have less money and the economy really hasn't rebounded to fact, despite the fact that they had more income. So yeah, I don't, I don't think the market makes it to the election, but the election is certainly going to be a factor here. Mm, okay, so you're pretty bearish on, on the markets. What does that mean in terms of um, long-term investment planning? I'm thinking of people thinking about uh, planning for retirement later, you know, not financial advice, but, but what are the principles that, that you, know, you come back to in this time of uncertainty? Yeah, in fact, I'm really concerned about that because if you look at how investment 
stocks are held today, most of the market is sitting in five U.S. tech companies and 90% or, or I'm sorry, 90% of the market is owned by half of American households. So they have all their wealth tied up into five tech stocks. And because everyone believes in the Fed, they really are overweight stocks. They, they hardly own any bonds they, in, in any form of portfolio insurance for that matter. And we've seen what happened in the dot-com bubble. We've seen what happened in the great financial crisis is investors put their faith in the Fed and it was a wrong move. And yeah, I, I am bearish and I believe the Fed will prove me right. But unfortunately, investors have not taken the necessary means to protect themselves from the downside, which will only make things worse. Right. So effectively, it'll uh, continue to spiral down. Those large big techs, which have been dominating the markets for quite some time, probably will catch a cold and that will then flow on and create a more downdraft. Yes, I agree with that. And part of the thing that I don't think most investors realize is it wasn't the Fed that drove the market over the 10 years. It was corporate share buybacks. And even though some people are saying that now that the Fed's buying corporate bonds, that will trigger more buybacks. But the reality is, is the corporations, if they were to be still borrowing money to buy their stocks back, which we'll, of course, find out more here in the quarter two data, is they still have to make the interest payments on those bonds and they still have to pay those bonds off when they're over. So just because the Fed's buying their debt now doesn't mean the euphoria of this corporate share buyback boom is back. In fact, my guess is it's mostly going to be gone. We'll find that out soon enough. Yeah, okay. Well, very interesting, Stephen. I appreciate your time today. Um, if people want to find out more about you and what you're up to on your YouTube channel, where do they go? Uh, sure. They can go to my channel. Uh, they can look my name up, which is Stephen Van Meter. It's S-T-E-V-E-N-V-A-N-M-E-T-R-E. -E -E, and you can put that in any search engine and you'll find my blog and my YouTube channel. Really appreciate your time. And uh, perhaps we can catch up again down the track as uh, things develop. I really appreciate your time today and enjoyed talking with you. I would really enjoy that, Martin, and I'll look forward to the next time. Great. Thank you very much. Take care. Thank you. Bye-bye.